Hello and welcome to the Real Estate Hot Topics Program, our Leadership Lounge edition. Today, we're going to be tackling a very interesting topic. And topic is needing change. Quite often people talk about resisting change and change management. But what if you need to change and what do you need to do next? And I've got a great story to bring that all together. Please welcome from the Central Coast of New South Wales, Mr. Andre Kubeka. Andre, welcome aboard. Hi, Lee. Thank you for having me. We always start with this question, but what is your total time in real estate? Started in 2001, so that makes it about 19 years, Lee. 19 years. You were from the Hills District. Uh, that's where it all started for you. But prior to real estate is an even more important question. What did you do prior to real estate? Well, out of school, I went in the university, wanted originally to be an engineer, started a degree in civil engineering, lasted about six months doing that. Didn't really like it, all of the maths and so on. Wanted to build bridges, but obviously that wasn't for me. Transferred into IT and continued and completed that and then got my first job in IT. Now, we've got an amazing story coming up today, but that all adds up to me of you've actually always been a modern management thinking person, whereas quite often from the real estate industry, we see management's learned from the original principal selling person What's that different chip in the brain for you? Not really sure, Lee. I've always liked innovation, always liked new technology and a smarter, better way of doing things. Um, And I suppose that's been inbred in me over many years of my upbringing. I had my own very set uh, ways of looking at things and looking at um, how to continually improve. How would you describe your leadership or management style? Pretty much hands-on, lead by example. I love the situations where it's all hands on deck and you get down and dirty in the trenches with all of the team. And that's when you get a real true indication of who you've got around you. And particularly coming out recently out of the COVID situation, it was quite interesting to observe the different personalities and characters involved. And not only how we handle that, but also how other organisations handle that. What have you learnt from your time in corporate then coming into something like the real estate industry, cottage industry, servicing the consumer. Like business to business is very different to business to consumer. And then learning the art of selling real estate to the level that you have. You've done very successful as auctioneering, real estate sales, leadership management. You've worn every hat through that time. But what's been your biggest shift of learning from corporate to residential real estate? I think the biggest shift for me is um, transitioning from a person that's on the tools, so to speak, actually out there doing it yourself to then the point of leadership. So to be a great salesperson, I feel you somewhat have to be a little bit selfish. It is about you. It is about your performance. You're accountable to yourself. Often you're accountable to the leadership of the organization. But to be a good leader, you got to be selfless. you got to be willing to give up some of your time. you got to be willing to teach and learn without the expectation of having something instantly returned to you. So often you find good salespeople have that difficulty in making that transition where it's all about me to it's all about us. And that's what I find the biggest difference. Very interesting. And Andre, you're at corporate marriage, meaning you're (laughs) running the sales and leadership side of the business and your incredible wife, Samantha, runs the property management business. I didn't mention the brands first up because that's going to be part of our topic today. But as we record today, how many offices, how many people, how many properties, just to give our listener an understanding of the organisation. Okay, so currently we're George Brand, and George Brand has eight residential sales offices and a strata office. We have decided to make a change, and um, our two offices, so that's one in Tukli and one in Terrigal, we will be known as Brand Property in the future. So um, we currently have a number of properties in the portfolio under rental. Um, We've got nine property managers, three leasing consultants, business development manager, and just recently we've appointed a general manager as well to try and tie everything in together. We've got, oh, geez, at last count, 10 salespeople, including Samantha and myself, Um, and that fluctuates a little bit based on the time of market and performance and all of the rest of it, and then naturally the admin staff in and around that. And we also have five virtual assistants in the Philippines. Now, George Brand has been a very famous Central Coast brand for many, many years. You've had a huge innings there, 19 years with the George Brand organisation, which brings us to our topic, needing change. As a future leader coming through this new world, 
what was on your mind, and it must be on your mind for the last few years, of why change is going to be needed and the decision to change brand? Sorry, Lee, just a quick correction there. It's 15 years since we're George Brand. 15? Yeah. So 15 years, and look, we've been very loyal to George Brand, as they have been with us. It's a great family-type business, um, really great operators. Um, so making that decision to, you know, do our own thing into the future, it wasn't an easy one because they are all genuinely nice people and do a fantastic job. We're slightly different in that we've wanted to continue to innovate, continue to grow, and we've just found that, um, you know, it's hard to bring all of that together and continue our journey, which now probably needs to run a parallel alongside them. It's not been a um, an awkward or a nasty separation. Um, I've still got a lot of respect for the leadership of the group as well as all of the principals there. And I hope that we can still continue to work together and share ideas and concepts. But um, it's probably time to take a little bit of a, a control of our own destiny, so to speak. Now, I've looked at the uh, new artwork today. It looks stunning, very contemporary, very clean. White's a prominent colour. I don't think there's been a, a better colour developed than white. And the word brand, uh, it's very interesting that everyone needs a brand, they want a brand, and we look at the brand on the signboard. What was the decision to call it brand? The decision was we wanted to certainly recognise the heritage and the name of George Brand on the Central Coast. It's um, uh, we, we were uh, obviously George Brand for a number of years. In the past, we also acquired uh, another business called Peter Brand, who was there before George. So to us, it made a bit of sense to maintain a bit of integrity over the brand. So remembering our past, but also now looking to the future and carrying on some of that heritage. It's very hard to get any group of people to, doesn't matter what group they are. I do a lot of facilitation and I sit on advisory boards and in 12 people in a room, the more people you get, the harder it is. And no right or wrong, just people see and do things different. Whereas now you've got that control and decision now that you have that you're on your own direction what are the things you want to bring to the business moving forward and where do you see the future of real estate i see the future of real estate as larger organizations run consistently with a common theme also with common rules and guidance everybody rowing in the same direction with a clear vision and a clear purpose Sometimes when you've got multiple uh, organisations working together, whilst the intentions are, are great and right, you have that difficulty in bringing everybody together. They, some of them want something slightly different, whether I want these signboards instead of these ones. I want mine portrait instead of landscape. Uh, I don't particularly like that little uh, slant on the colour scheme. I like this. So running it um, more consistently, and I have seen some brands do it particularly well on a large scale, um, there needs to be a lot of um, discipline, a lot of control, and unfortunately, that's not easily done. Um, so there needs to be some regimented rules and guidelines around that sort of thing, which I think George Brandt, as well as many other smaller groups, have had difficulty um, in um, controlling that sort of thing. When we look at leadership moving forward, and you've attracted some very good agents to the company that have come over to plug and play into what you offer, especially in a time where other organisations are offering bigger splits, but it's not always there behind the scenes. In It can be expensive to work for a high commission company because you've got to do everything yourself. What was your leadership decision on the essential services that you'd provide to others? So we try and still work off perhaps a bit of an old-fashioned system when it comes to um, recruitment and uh, providing support for our both our sales agents and our uh, property management people, and in fact, anybody that works for us. It is very much a family sort of environment. So we've all got to recognise that there is a cost to running a business, there is a cost to marketing and positioning it, and there is a cost to bringing new business opportunities to be able to be shared around the rest of the team. I don't believe that some of these splits that are um, being you know, offered around by some of the, I suppose, the newer entrants into real estate um, are sustainable. You can't run a business off paying an agent 75, 80, 85% and then still have the infrastructure that's required to run a business properly. You are then going to get a very fractured sort of business and very limited in success. And um, I'd rather be getting, say, 50% of a much larger pie than 80% of a non-existent pie. 80% of nothing's nothing. And if you're not going to have the level of, what well, you just mentioned, your offshore team, your onshore team, 
you know, all those humans who are making the whole process or the platform come together. And we look at any piece of real estate today, it's very rare one person does anything. It could be 15, 16 sets of hands that need to touch the property from lead generation right through to compliance and settlement and making sure the funds get into our our vendor's bank account. That is not as simple as it was. There's a lot of tech involved, a lot of technique. And I spend a lot of my time with salespeople saying, don't underestimate what's in there. There's more to this than meets your eye until you've had to do it. And I urge all people to give full consideration to that infrastructure and have a chat with the leader of, okay, what's my to-do list and what's my to don't list? What's provided, what's not? And you're right, we've seen a lot of new entrants come in and quite often they're from outside of the real estate space thinking, well, we'll just give them, them all the money, but we won't give them anything else. But that doesn't make the customer experience or the brand experience a strong one. Absolutely, Lee. And I mean, we've just been recently looking at our app stack, for example, and all of the monthly subscriptions that go into the, I don't know, the 20 or 30 different applications that have become necessary to run a business these days um, is phenomenal. I haven't changed our splits, but we've absorbed a bunch of these new costs to try and run things more efficiently and more productively. But it is quite interesting as well to see that some agents thrive in that environment and others you know, sink. Um, so it's not for everybody. There, there are still very commission-only agent orientations versus the ones that need that secure salary to relieve a bit of pressure. And I have my own theory about that. Yeah, whilst we've got a combination of both commission-only and um, salaried salespeople with target systems, they're different types of people and different types of expectations. So Yeah, it's an interesting um, mixture and an interesting juggle with motivation and performance and so on. My best performing agent, Aaron Rebelt, at the moment, um, he's a a salaried agent with the split and we support him with assistance. And, um, you know, he's probably going to clock over 70 or 80 sales on a a rolling year. So that's a phenomenal performance for one person and one admin assistant. Absolutely. But I like what you just tapped into there. Different people need different approaches. Mm. There isn't just one way to do it. And I've seen this many times where technically you could go to a person at the end of the financial year and said, if you were on a commission-only deal, you know you would have earned more. And they go, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't have been sleeping at night, so I wouldn't have sold anything. Exactly right. You've got to respect that, that we all tick different. Mm -hmm. Uh, Not everything's about the cut you get. It's about the position you hold and how you feel working in an organisation. I think it's especially with COVID, has become more important than ever. Yeah, absolutely. And you're absolutely right when you say that, um, you know, different people handle pressure and stress um, vastly differently. And again, as we've seen recently, yeah, your commission-only guys, it's like their own business and they just carry on. Some of your other staff uh, are a little bit more concerned with they've got kids or if they've got mortgages and so on and so forth, and they're not used to dealing with that uncertainty of, Am I going to get paid? Um, am I am I going to have an income? Am I going to have a job in a few months' time? And we've been quite fortunate. We made a decision when um, all of this COVID started back in uh, March, mid-March, that we weren't going to lose any of our staff. We were going to make sure we worked right the way through it. We were very, very um, strong on that point. We adjusted and modified the way we did things to adapt to, obviously, a changing environment. And our figures incredibly went up in that first month after the initial semi-lockdown, the property management figures went up by 20%. Our sales figures after the initial 7 to 10 days um, consistently now over the last few months have been up by 25 to 30% on the previous year. So I found that a very interesting learning curve because what you thought and what you strongly thought turned out to be the complete opposite. Yeah, it's an amazing thing. And to me, I have a lot of salespeople at times because obviously I'm dealing with the salespeople every day in every way, anywhere from three to 500 a week. And sometimes I'll have a salesperson say to me, oh, Lee, but I could go here and earn more money. I go, yeah, just think about that because you're in a very protected environment at the moment. You haven't felt the pressure of where's that going to come from and it's not going to arrive for a period of time. And I know myself, I had a phenomenal sales career, but I was incredibly protected. My principal kept everything away from me. Uh, We had essential services, we were paid on exchange. I could do nothing but listen to sell real estate. And it's only that I look back now and think how protected I was by my leader to do what I do. Don't worry about any of this other stuff. You just do that one thing you do well, get in the lounge room and get people to say yes. 
But then you become a business owner and think, wow, I had no idea that was all going on. Where do you see, and this is a big, broad question, but we're hearing a lot of rumbles out there in the jungle now about Agent Direct and the principles could be under threat. You know, how do you feel about that when we're seeing brands bring out direct selling systems for the agents? That's the million dollar question. Where Where is the industry going to go? I've had my own thoughts over a number of years, actually. I think we're going to see basically two versions of a real estate practice or real estate business. You're going to have your larger organisations where they might employ a few hundred um, staff over a uh, you know, a spoken wheel type model where there's a head office and some satellite offices, which will have the economies of scale, which will be able to outsource, which will be able to take advantage of technology and the economies of scale. And then the other end will be the sole operator. That's a very good agent that might be a husband and wife team or a husband and assistant team that can work on minimal margins, work from home, save on overheads and still do very, very well. The difficulty will be to get from one to the other if you want to go that way without a significant investment. So um, with the way I think the, the whole industry is going, certainly locally here in New South Wales, with the legislations and the licensing requirements and so on, running a business is going to become more and more um, difficult, uh, more and more compliant, more and more regulated. And I support that actually because I feel that um, the more professional we become, the better the name of a real estate agent will be. I certainly consider myself on a similar sort of profession as a solicitor or an accountant or a financial advisor or planner, whereas you sort of look around and maybe not everybody's on that same sort of level, but I'd love to see the industry known for that sort of standard of professionalism right across the board. So, um, yeah, the cost of doing business is certainly going to go up, hopefully to eliminate some of the, yeah, the ones that don't invest, the ones that kind of cut a few corners. That's where I sort of see it going. Yeah, good answer. And Andre, you enjoy business and then you happen to be in real estate, but you are a business person. And I've been able to observe you for many, many years, be it at leadership conferences. You were just chatting today about something you picked up from one of our leaders from Sweden. Uh, you're looking internationally of what's going on, not just local. And you have that passion to be a good business person. The real estate space in the last six months, I'm absolutely fascinated and pleased of how many principals have decided to not continue on and plug into a company like yours because they know how hard it is to do the compliance and all the government data breaching, privacy acts. There's so much going on now that there's hardly any time to just sell real estate. So you've got to make that decision of, am I a professional real estate person who likes to service the purchasing and selling community or do I want to run a business? Now, I know you've had the option or the need to do both but you're quite clear on your business side of it and how you see a professional organisation moving forward. I, I remember back in 2001 when I went and did my certificate of registration up at Hornsby TAFE and the, the guy that was presenting the course made a comment that whenever you're looking at the value of a property, you look at it from the highest and best use perspective and you price it or value it or appraise it accordingly. I look at people much the same way. I sort of look at it an individual and I look at what is their highest and best use within our environment. Sometimes you've got a sales agent that thinks they're a great sales agent, but they might not be a great sales agent. They might be a great assistant agent. They might be a good lead generator, but listing and selling might not be their best use. And it might be difficult for them to come to terms with that as well. So I try and place square pegs in square holes. And sometimes it is difficult to have those conversations. But for me, look, I'm okay as an agent, I suppose. Um, in my best year, I've probably written seven hundred and fifty odd thousand dollars, which isn't fantastic by the scheme of things from what you hear about some of the um, the top performers. But that, alongside running a business and property management and the rest of it, is probably where I could tap out. Right, my highest and best use, I feel, is in organisation and in recognising talent and helping that person develop to whatever their highest and best use is over the last few years, made a complete change in our organisation. We had some cultural issues that um, needed addressing, which we addressed. We basically cut it right back like a shrub in um, wintertime, cut it right back and then let it grow and it's now thriving. So when I talk to sales agents that have got that aspiration of wanting to maybe own their own business in the future, I sort of explain it to them like this. You're a great sales agent 
and you, you list and sell really well. Why would you want to stop doing that and then spend 50% on your time doing something that maybe you're not going to like or maybe you're not terribly good at, which is managing a business, handling creditors, hiring and firing, all of the rest of the stuff that goes alongside running a business, as opposed to just focusing 100% of your efforts into what is your highest and best skill, which is listing, selling and negotiating. And I suppose a lot of our guys share that same ideal now. Now, that doesn't preclude you from investing in a real estate business because we do offer options where, you know, a good agent after a period of time, and I sort of use this terminology, let's get engaged before we get married. Let's see how we work together, whether our values align, and then they can invest into something that's tangible, like a portion of the rent roll, where there's a good residual income, plus there's an asset base. And if the day comes that they do want to move on, whether that's in partnership or in isolation, Well, they've got an asset that they can work off and build a future from there. But I dare say they'd probably see a benefit in continuing to work with us because of the infrastructure, the systems and procedures that we can offer and maybe not having the distractions of running a business. Couldn't agree more. In your study of lots of things that have happened in the last 12 months, I noticed you brought your attention to looking at the one team model. Mm -hmm. What attracted you to that style of working versus the traditional model? Uh, what is very interesting to me is it's very difficult to find one person in sales that's a great prospector, that's a great presenter, a great marketer, a great negotiator, a great closer, and finding that in the one individual that can do everything at the elite level. I think it's much easier to find someone that's going to be brilliant at prospecting, for example, or lead generation, and not have, again, the distractions of dealing with buyers or dealing with uh, sellers when it comes time to sell. So it's not something that we've developed properly yet. It's still in the conceptual stage for us. But I feel that from a business perspective will, again, go the next level of getting the best out of each individual where they're focusing on the area that they're best at, as opposed to, again, being distracted by, I don't know whether you've heard this, Lee, but I think most agents have difficulty in prospecting. We've got a young fella that's working alongside me, young Jack, and He's a prospecting machine. He's out there two, three hours a day, door knocking, letterbox dropping. And you know what? He loves it. <laughs> it's, it's, and, and it's amazing the results that you get when you actually enjoy doing something. So we don't just send him out there and say, Jack, go out and prospect. Um, this is the script and the dialogue that you use for this particular instance. And this is the one that you use for this one. And you're now hot spotting around this particular property for this reason. So there's always a purpose behind it and hopefully an objective of an outcome of what we want to achieve out of that. But um, would Jack be good at listing? Probably not right at the moment. That'll be something that he might develop into later down the track. But let's master one set of skills first before you go and introduce another one. But can you do all of them at the elite level all at the same time? I think that's a pretty tough ask for most people. When we look at you know the five key things the leader's focusing on, Uh, This interview has brought out some really interesting one, hence we called it Needing Change. And changing brand was definitely a big one for you, and it takes a while to contemplate that decision. Then you get to the artwork design stage, which is not simple. You know, there's a lot of thinking to come up with the final design, and people see it and go, wow. But there's, I know myself, there's just hundreds and thousands of hours of thought that goes into that. You're now looking at structural change of you know, a blended opportunity for people. You might have the the brilliant solo operator. You might have the team-based EBU, effective business unit, or do we have some young talents coming through that get their master's degree as they come through lead generation to, uh, which what happened to a lot of the great agents, you got you got a chance in lead generation, and then after doing a few deals and seeing a few things, you get to move on, which is what we now call the leverage agent. What else are you passionate about moving forward that, you're going to be able to do now with this, you've made the change, you needed the change, but what will you be focusing on from here on in? The values and the culture of our organisation is very, very important um, and they're, they're things that we're not going to compromise on. A lot of the um, implementation side of things with structure um, and consistency, they're not going to be compromised on. And I think that's probably the benefit of most successful groups is that they're all, again, rowing in the same direction, going in the same thought process. Even from a recruitment perspective, I see us in the future doing the recruitment for our entire network where we're onboarding people. Part of 
uh, our criteria, I hope you don't mind me saying this, Lee, will be involving uh, a subscription with Real Estate Academy where you go through the Complete Salesperson Program, you then step through your um, swim lanes and you understand how that business operates so that there's consistency. So when we're undertaking the training and also selection process, we know that that person is going to suit all of our values. And when they're placed into uh, a company, whether it's our own or it's a franchise or an associated company, they're going to fit in. They're going to know what to do from day one. And when they need a little bit of tweaking and a little bit of help along the way, well, we've got a structure there that can help them continue on with that, as opposed to if it's the principal of the office that might be a listing and selling principal and more than likely is, they don't need to worry about that as much as what they would have if they're out on their own and going solo. So that's where I see our future going and the big benefit of, I mean, our, our plans and our vision, right? Bringing it all together and having one set of database, one way of doing things. Our Philippines team can get, just get added on and added on and they're all doing things in unison in the same way. So it's very easy to monitor, very easy to control, very easy to measure and making sure that it's consistent from a training perspective. Andre, how big will you take this? Oh, look, um, <laughs> so I, I, I jokingly say to Samantha, I'm, I'm just a simple real estate agent just trying <laughs> to make ends meet, which, which, look, that's honestly the way I see myself. I've been lucky to, to be surrounded by good people that are like-minded. We sort of value certain characteristics about individuals. We're not, uh, I suppose, for lack of better terminology, an ego-driven organisation. We are there to serve and we don't lose sight of that. We do want to genuinely help people in their moving process, whether it be rentals, whether it's a, a landlord investing in properties and, and, you know, your terminology, profit from our knowledge. I find that very, very true from the way we like to operate. How far do we take it? Look, I suppose it'll just come down to the people that might want to see value in what we do and how we do it. But we're not going to be just putting bums on seats. It's not the purpose of this. The purpose of this is to align ourselves with the right individuals that share a common vision, a very similar purpose to our own, so that that process of moving forward in that same direction is easy, not difficult. It's not um, grow at all costs for us. When we were doing the preparation for today's program and netting change is such a great topic for everyone out there and these times have really accelerated a lot of thought for a lot of people. But you did make the comment about the curtains don't always match the drapes. Explain that to us. Well, yeah, I think that terminology has been used for in, other, uh, in other ways. Again, I, I suppose I learnt this from other real estate organisations coming through pro- probably over the last 10 to 15 years where um, there's a very significant investment in the external image. And people think that the external image is often the, the reality and it's a perception. But you also realise that perception is often true in most people's minds. So we've always seen ourselves as very innovative, um, very creative, um, very professional from the back end. But the outside, in some of our clients' minds or even in our local community's mind, didn't reflect that. So what we want to do is have the outside look like we are on the inside. So hence the reason having the curtains match the drapes. And we've spent a lot of time with, um, you know, surveying not only our staff, but also uh, many of the local members of the community to hopefully try and get that right. So with our facelift, if you like, and a subtle name change, like I said before, wanted to recognise our history, where we've come from, but also say, hey, this is who we are now and this is where we're going into the future. And we are innovative. We are the best at what we do. I don't believe there's anybody in the local marketplace where we operate that do things as proficiently and efficiently as what we do. And I genuinely believe that we're the best in the business up there. Sometimes it's hard to sell that for various reasons, but we do have our clients' best interests at heart at all times. So we just want to get that message across. Andre, great interview and lots of information on many layers here for our leaders, EBU leaders and future leaders. And it's great to speak to a leader at this time that's been a very challenging time for all businesses. What's got you so excited about the future of real estate now? What's really ticking it for you? As you know, Lee, I've, I've been attending the, the Academy's um, uh, courses for quite a number of years. I've lost track of how many years, to be honest. I don't know how many times I've sat through the the complete salesperson course, and um, I've got a roadmap in my office, and it's taped up on the back of the doors 
and now I'm teaching some of the younger guys coming through. And in fact, we're all going along to the um, the complete sales course in the Hunter Valley where I think we've got 12 or 14 of our staff going. It's a checklist and it's a process and it's a continual improvement process. It, you're never going to get to the end of this because there's always some new bit of technology or some new better way of doing things. And sometimes it doesn't even come from real estate. It comes from outside. And I spend a bit of my time now looking externally, not just from what our competitors or some of the smart operators in the business are doing, but what some you know aligned businesses are doing. So there's a lot of information out there, but it's, it's a continual process. And I suppose we've got a culture of learning in our organization, and uh, we're continually looking for something that might improve the experience of our clients, um, something that might make things a little bit more efficient or a little bit easier on our staff in communication. So we're, we're continually reviewing that and continually working in that direction. Where do we see ourselves in the future from that perspective? Look, we're going to continue to learn. I don't think I did quite some time ago when I was transitioning between another training group to yours. And I can tell you what, it was black and white as far as the differences then, but you didn't know at that stage at how different training and, and information was to be. The one thing I learned is you got to continue to learn. Otherwise, if you're standing still, you're actually being left behind. You're either moving forward or, mate, you're going out the back door. So we don't intend to be going out the back door anytime soon. Well, Andre of the brand new brand group, <laughs> love the artwork, love the decision. Great to see you passionate about what you're doing moving forward. Uh, you've already achieved so many things, but this is a great example of needing change. And I think a lot of people fear change. I have people ring me, it's leaking help us with change management. And you think, yeah, we can. But change is good. Change is not bad. And so many people think, oh, but I don't want to change. You can't think that way if you're progressive. But as you said, to be left behind, and every day, everything you do when you go to work, you're either adding or you're subtracting. And I know myself, uh, especially in this new digital age from being a touring seminar speaker to that being ended to what will I do now, I've learned so many things in the last four weeks that it's really exciting that you can learn so much in the last 14 weeks. You're doing it on a leadership level. We look forward to seeing the continued success. But I want to thank you for coming in and appearing on Real Estate Hot Topics. Thanks, Lee.